Now look at Back to the Future, Dice Through Time from Ravensburger, who I must also thank for sending us a review copy of this game. All right, Back to the Future, Dice Through Time was designed by Ken Franklin, Chris Leader, and Kevin Rogers, published in 2020 by Ravensburger. One play of this dice-driven cooperative game takes about an hour or longer, depending on which difficulty you decide to play at. Now, Dice Through Time is a cooperative game where two to four players take on the role of Marty and Doc, each starting at a different timeline. Yes, that's right. Each player is playing Marty and Doc. Players are working together to stop Biff, who's stolen the DeLorean, and messed with the timeline for his own profit. Now, you do this by traveling through time, completing events to earn items, and then returning those items to the proper place and time. To get a look at the components in this time travel board game, be sure to check out our Back to the Future Dice Through Time unboxing video on YouTube. I also go over the components in the game on detail on the blog version of this review. What I will say here, without getting into too much detail, is that the components are rather good. You got a solid looking, wow, it's bright board. Uh, plastic DeLorean tokens, thick player boards, lots of cards, and some pretty cool custom dice. Now, I do want to call out a rather unique look to this game. The aesthetic of this game is, is not what you would expect from a Back to the Future game. Like, my guess is Ravensburger did not get the license to the movie or the comic book artwork or the actors or anything like that, because everything in this game has this... I, I'm having a hard time describing it. It's like this blocky, chunky, modern, abstract art. Like, it reminds me of something you'd find in, like, a Microsoft clip art or icons. Um, it's also worth noting the dice aren't etched in any way. These are printed. So over time, there is the possibility the sides will eventually get rubbed off, though I do expect that will take a long time and lots of plays. And with today's modern gaming society of one and done, I doubt anyone's going to play it enough for it to happen, but I figure it's worth noting. So how does a game of Back to the Future Dice Through Time play? All right, so you start by laying out the board, putting a Biff standee on each Biff starting location. There's one Biff in all the times, uh, whether it's Biff or one of his relatives. Uh, event cards are shuffled, placed on their spot. Einstein, Einstein tokens, Einstein being your dog, are flipped face down and randomized, placed beside the board with a bunch of Paradox tokens. Players are then going to select a color. They're going to take a playing board. The four dice in their color are their DeLorean figure in that color. They're going to place the DeLorean on the clock tower space in their starting time period. Each of the four players starts at a different time. Players decide on a difficulty ranging from science experiment beginner to nobody calls me chicken insane and take the appropriate number of item cards for each time period, shuffle them and place them beside the board. Start player is the player who has so far traveled the most through time, aka the oldest. Now, this doesn't directly impact this game specifically. It's more an overall comment. But does anyone not have Schwazi anymore? <laughs> I mean, do we actually need these arbitrary start player ideas in games? Because last week we had Bricks and Brutes, which was the youngest player starts mm -hmm. or the oldest player starts. And the problem with that I have is that if a family sits down to a game, it's always going to be the same person who starts or mm -hmm. always going to be the same, uh, you know, if they're the youngest or always going to start, start if it's the oldest and you don't get that, you know, the chance for someone else to start, which Fair. I think detracts from uh, some gameplays. I do agree though. I got to say, I kind of dig this one because it's one of the few ways the game actually ties in the theme of the game by throwing some time element to it. But as for this one, start however you like the rule book, as you start with the oldest player. Or if you do have a time traveler who's traveled through more points in time than you, they would obviously start as well. So at the start of each turn, you're going to draw event cards. The event cards are based on the number of players. Special events are read out loud and cause something to happen. Like you've run out of gas, so you can't move as far this turn. Or um, There's a whole bunch of them. I'm not even going to get into the specifics. Most of the cards, though, are event cards that are tied to happenings in the three different Back to the Future movies. Each event happens at a certain time and space, and you the card shows it with, a, again, one of those graphics on it with a couple symbols at the top of the card. This is placed on the appropriate spot on the board. Once the events are played, again, based on the number of players, players will roll their four dice. Each turn, players spend dice to do actions. The various dice sides are flux capacitors. 
Spend that to move to the same location in any other year. Arrow, spend one of those to move to any location in the same year you're in. The fist is used to move Biff from your current location to any other location in the year. What Biff does is stops you from completing events. Lightning bolts let you re-roll any number of your other dice. The Doc Brown symbol, which I got to admit is the coolest symbol on the dice with the hair and the goggles, lets you remove Paradox tokens from anywhere on the board. More about those in a bit. And then there's the wrench. Those can be used as any other icon when completing an event, which again, I'll get to in a second. Now, in addition to spending the dice based on what side you rolled, there are other important actions you can take. One that every player has is to use their Mr. Fusion in their DeLorean by spending two dice with the same icon to get any other icon. That's your little bit of randomness mitigation. Movement, you can spend any die with any icon to move one space in the current year, because the board's divided up into four years with five different spots at each year. Completing an event. This is part of the main goal of the game. You're going to spend dice matching the symbols on the event card. Remember I noted the event card has an icon in the top corner, or you're going to spend dice with those symbols on them. As long as Biff's not there. If Biff's there, he prevents you from doing so. When an event's completed, you're going to draw a random item card from that time period. No players can only hold two items at a time, but they can continue to complete events, which they may want to do to prevent paradox. Next is returning an item. So you've gotten an item from a previously completed event, you bring it to the right spot and place and time, and you reward, you, you hand it in. As a reward, you're going to move the out of time marker back one spot. Uh, that's one of the end game conditions we'll get to in a minute. And you're going to flip over an Einstein token. This is your helpful pup who's with you. Einstein tokens have the various dice size symbols on them. And then they go on the top of the board and anyone can spend them later on a later turn. Then the most interesting and coolest thing in the game, in my opinion, is rippling a die. You leave a die on the space you're on. That die can now be used by any other player at the same location during that year or at the same location in any later year. So you can't have time travel if you can't send yourself or others resources through time anymore, it mm. seems. Uh, it's a great sort of mechanic or concept. It's not a, This is a specific mechanic to this game, but it's a great concept for a mechanic mm that we're seeing in variations of a few different games with, uh, yep. we, you know, we've got you're loaning yourself money in other games we've talked about recently. And, and this is, it's, it's a, an interesting concept for different mechanics that uh, mm -hmm. is, is slowly getting introduced more often. Now, once everyone's taken their turns, all the players have acted, they spent all their dice, they've rippled all their dice, they're, they've done everything they want to do you have this tracker at the top with the out of time license plate and it's going to move up. That's based on how many active events there are in the most messed up year. And if that ever reaches spot 12, the game ends. And then at the end of every year, every year that's messed up starts generating, uh, drawing a blank on the word. Paradox. Yes. Thank you. Paradox tokens get placed on those locations so it gets even worse. And that's where using those Doc Brown rolls to remove Paradox comes into play. Basically, it's the events get bad, and if you let them continue to get bad, there's a, there's a, a steamroller effect where it just keeps getting worse and worse. The players eventually win if they're able to return all of the items from all the different time periods to their proper place and time. And again, they lose if that out-of-time marker ever gets to the end of the track, which actually only has 12 spaces on it. Uh, simple enough win lose condition uh, win uh, win lose conditions to be sure and just just so everyone understands uh, who's listening when we're saying out of time marker it's actually a license plate that features the word all jammed together out of time yeah uh, all 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 crammed together in a license plate format and that is the license plate that's on the DeLorean in the movies which is where that comes from now before I start to share my final thoughts on this game if it isn't evident yet i want to make sure everyone knows what game we're talking about this game in question is back to the future dice through time from ravensburger this game i'm talking about is not back to the future back in time from funko games what we have here is the same problem we have with scooby-doo escape from the haunted mansion and scooby-doo betrayal at mystery mansion a couple of games released almost at the same time within months of each other with the same intellectual property and similar names and not only that, similar mechanics. 
Yeah, and and The Shining as well. We ran into some name uh, collisions. It seems that instead of the old glut of mass market games we used to see, we're seeing people investing in real hobby games with those IP licenses, but still spreading the wealth between various designers. Yeah, We've seen a number this year as anniversaries for various products have rolled around and uh, and and you know triggered that uh, release schedule. Yeah, it's I, I admit it's frustrating. Like this particular Back to the Future game, the one I'm reviewing here, is the lighter of the two games. This is much more of a gateway game, and honestly, probably the better choice of the two for younger and more casual players. Back to the Future Dice Through Time is surprisingly simple to learn and set up. Mechanics are simple to pick up. My kids got it pretty much right away. And then added to that, the gameplay is well facilitated by a very clean system of iconography that I found you can get used to very quickly. There aren't a lot of different symbols and the symbols are clearly explained. And adding to that, there's a bonus of the player boards each explain not only the game sequence, but what all the different icons mean. Yeah, the clear iconography is a great change from some recent games that have had a rather less clear marking problem Mm. uh, and led to gameplay issues and extreme play. It's good to see that this one has clearly avoided that pitfall. I will admit I wish they were a little bigger, but not everyone has the same aging eyes I do. Now, I said it before, and I'll say it again. The neatest bit in this game is the way the designers have done some cool stuff with the time travel thing. Like, the ripple mechanic's really brilliant. Like, the fact you leave something in the past so themselves or another player can use it as long as they're in the same location in the same year or later. That's brilliant. That works great. The paradox rules also work pretty well, where if you let too many events happen in one year, it can be catastrophic. And there's a big penalty in the game if two players end up at the same location in the same time period. Because remember, everyone's playing the same two people. You're all playing Doc and Marty at different periods of time. And you never want to meet yourself in a time travel game or any other time travel story. That actually advances that out of time token two spaces. And again, it's only 12 long. So that's, that's a rough one. Although, interestingly, Back to the Future's movies aren't even consistent with the whole meeting oneself paradox. Uh, in the first game, in the first movie, Doc makes a big deal out of it. Um, but uh, in the second movie, Biff and Jen both meet themselves uh, without any real consequences. Uh, so they've, but it's nice that they've gone with that real, you know, the, the canon. Everyone mm. remembers the speech of Doc Brown. You know, you can't meet yourself, Marty, um, and that's and that's what they've gone with on this one. So in this, you can. It is just moved up too, so it right. can be worth it. In games we have played, we have chose the dis- decision to meet together because the end result was worth it, that we cleared a, a difficult event or we were able to hand in two items so offset that time, out of time marker moving up. So it, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that you're penalized for doing it. Right. Now, unfortunately, those time travel mechanics we just talked about are pretty much the only places where the Back to Future theme really sticks out. Uh, The rest of the game's really pretty abstract. Like, each location on the board holds three cards, and there are only three cards per location in the entire deck of events, and there are exactly three cards per location in that deck. And these cards are basically identical. They have the exact same art on them, they have the exact same text, they have the exact same name. The only difference is the icons that come up. While these are all iconic scenes from the movies, there's nothing really other than that, again, very abstract graphics and the name of the card to tie it to it. Like, there's no flavor text here. There's nothing really to explain what's going on if you haven't seen the movies. And to be honest, I started ignoring even what the card said. I just looked at what icons they wanted. There wasn't a lot here that said Back to the Future to me. Right, and it certainly didn't help that they didn't get the rights to any actual imagery from any of the official properties to help make it feel more connected. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then the other complaint I have uh, is a lack of variety. Like we've had a handful of plays here and we've already seen every event in every time period. We've seen every special event and every game has already started to feel the same. You're solving the same events with the same dice icons, trying to get the same icons or items and return them to the same places. Now, it's not to say that every game plays identical, like the order of the event cards, what items are in play each game, the vagaries of the dice and which Einstein tokens get flicks, flipped does add randomness and variability to each play, but just they all feel the same. You don't really get any difference between it. Right. 
So in many ways, uh, despite what I said earlier, this does seem feel like more of a mass market game than a hobby one. Uh, mm. Despite the quality components and, and well, uh, well made game, it's that same sort of play in and again feel you get from many of those mass market games, uh, as opposed to the difference between plays one often feels during a hobby game. Yeah, like like we had fun. It wasn't a terrible game. We had fun playing it. Um, I it it's lighter than I thought it was getting. Like I just from Ravensburger, um, I expected. Well, Ravensburger makes kid games. They made Dice Me or uh, King Me, and they they make you know um, Labyrinth. But something about this box just I, I expected more of a, a a strategy board game, a heavier board game. Now, the first place, of course, we were just with Deanna, and then I went, wow, this is light enough. We should play this with the kids. And that this ended up being a good family game, a good family weight game. My kids enjoyed it. Um, nothing on the box to me says it's marketed to kids, because I think mainly it's marketed to adults with nostalgia for Back to the Future. But I think this one is definitely more of a, a family weight lighter game, possibly on that mass market side, though better than many mass market games. It's it's on the it's it's the blending the it's yeah. kind of like the euro and the ameritrash blending together you got the mass market and the hobby game blending together this would fit perfectly well on a shelf at a scholar's choice on target would surprise me except for the license now i do have to say one kid did like it more than the other um my youngest actually felt there was too much coordination and talking like there was just too much having to plan together as a group before taking your turn where she just wanted to do her thing but she is the one that prefers competitive games to cooperative games so fair enough on that one Overall, I was impressed by the cool time travel mechanics, but I did find the connection to Back to the Future a bit weak. It just, it didn't feel like I was Marty and Doc thwarting Biff. It just felt like I was rolling dice, trying to match symbols, and bringing cards to the right spot on the board. I do think this is a solid gateway cooperative game, or family weight game. It's something with um, playing with kids, like kids that get into a game and just want to play it over and over and over again, they're not going to get as burnt out on it as quickly as uh, hobby gamers are. I think kids who like repetition are going to dig this game. I think for most groups, your average game group, probably most people listening to this podcast, I this is a try. Like, try it out before you buy it. Though if you have a family that's just like huge Back to the Future fans, and you know all the movies, and you know all the scenes, and you're going to get excited when you put down the skateboard in 1984 because Marty's on his way to school, you might want to give this one a chance, like before playing it, just go out and buy it and try it out. But in general, I do recommend to try before you play. It's 1985, so I don't know what I said. I said 84. So yeah, I, yeah. I'm not the huge Back to the Future fan. That's one of the things we did. Too. So, so one of the things this game will do is it will encourage your family to rewatch the movies or watch them for the first time if they haven't. I will admit this is important to note. Actually, my kids had no experience with this other than the Telltale video game on the iPad. That's their only uh, Back to the Future experience. So they knew who Einstein was. That was about the only thing I, I noticed while playing. So yes, yeah. yeah, so this will probably get us at some point as a family to sit down and rewatch the original trilogy. All right, then. Well, for more info on the Back to the Future Dice Through Time, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.